strange but familiar faces. <laughs> uh, just a, a reminder of, uh, of our FAME program. Uh, all of you obviously are aware of some of the advantages of being a member of our maintenance plan. Uh, I've been asked several times why we, why we have this. And if you've been in for a, a review of your estate plan, most of you have living trusts, uh, you know the first question I ask is, are all of your assets titled in your trust? So one of the uh, reasons that we started this, this uh, maintenance plan was to remind and encourage people to keep their estate plan current. So instead of waiting three to five years to uh, have a review, FAME members are invited every year to come in for a review. Now don't, uh, don't think you necessarily have to come in and see a lawyer to review your trust. I have clients who have told me that every year after Christmas when the kids go back home, they take their trust off the shelf, go through it to see if these are still the people they want to leave their assets, <laughs> their assets to. Uh, of course it will be, but uh, you may want to uh, to review that if there have been uh, maybe grandchildren with special needs or a change in circumstances. So review it yourself. But uh, as FAME members, take advantage of that annual review and, uh, and make sure that things are current. Uh, you uh, have a whole list of advantages of belonging to the FAME program. Uh, when your opportunity for renewal comes back up, uh, be sure and, and uh, send in a check or call in your, your credit card and renew your FAME membership. I think you'll find that it's always going to be a, a great benefit to you. One of the great benefits, of course, are events like these. Uh, now, uh, just starting with this event, uh, formerly you had to go onto a site called Vimeo. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's kind of like YouTube, but nobody's heard of it. Uh, now it's on YouTube. So. Uh, once we have uh, uh, finished today and gone through all the editing process and so forth, uh, this event will be available to you on YouTube, so you get a letter from us. You can watch it over again or share it with your friends and family. Uh, we're especially happy today to have been invited to this beautiful facility. I've, I've never been here before. It's an amazing uh, facility. Uh, we're very happy to um, uh, have uh, the... <coughs> Uh, special collections uh, uh, at, here at the university invite us uh, and to present for us today. And, and I'd like to uh, now uh, introduce you to Millie Mitchell, who is the Director of Development here at the uh, University of Special Collections Department and Libraries Department. And uh, I'll have her introduce our speaker and tell us a little bit about uh, who else is here and, and uh, whatever else she would like to say. So thanks everyone for coming. Let me move this hand off here. All right, I'll get it there. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Good. Welcome everyone. Do you feel like students in these chairs? A few people got the little arm rest up so you can take notes, that's good. Um, as Brad said, my name is Millie Mitchell, and I'm with Development and Alumni Relations for the University of Nevada. And uh, I have the great good fortune to call the Matthewson IGT Knowledge Center my office. You know, it's really hard to come to work here every morning, <laughs> I have to tell you. And I'm here to welcome you on behalf of the Dean of Libraries, Kathy Ray, who could not be here today. She's attending a conference in Los Angeles, but we are so grateful to Anderson, Dorn, and Rader for uh, wanting you all to come here to the university this morning and to the Knowledge Center and to learn a little bit more from our special collections staff about the treasures that might be hiding in your closets or, uh, you know, if in your attic, down in your basement, and how we go about preserving our materials. And uh, so we're glad to have you here. And uh, thank you especially to Bryce Rader, who's an alum of this university, uh, looking out for us and suggesting that this might be something that you all might be interested in and benefit from. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce you to Jackie Sunstrand, who works in special collections. Uh, Jackie is our manuscripts and archives librarian. 
She's our resident authority on what do you do with old crumbling newspapers, diary papers, photographs, scrapbooks, that kind of thing. Uh, Jackie um, has a master's degree in library science from USC. She also has a master's degree in history from UC Riverside, so you can kind of see where you know history and preservation come together. Um, she was very, very fortunate to have uh, an internship grant from the Mellon Foundation, and she spent a year at the Huntington Library, which is, you know, a special collections library of its own, which is wonderful. Um, her undergraduate degree is from uh, UC Fullerton in theater arts, which means she's also a pretty good presenter. So um, I don't want to take up any more of your time. I'll uh, have a chance to talk with you afterwards. We're going to do tours of the Knowledge Center if anybody would like to stick around. But I'm going to turn this over to Jackie. Hang on while I get suited up here. Well, welcome, and I hope I can thrill and chill you with all sorts of wonderful information. Make sure I've got everything on that I need to. All right. How many here might uh, also be alums of UNR? A few. Okay. Uh, currently living in Nevada, but came from another state. Me too. <laughs> California, was that the state? <laughs> okay, me too. Yeah, most of my professional career and education was uh, in the LA area, as um, Millie told you. So, um, probably die of that smog stuff <laughs> early on. But before I do, I will be taking care of many of the things that uh, we'll be talking with you today and at your using um, your attorney's office uh, for help in. And I want to thank you uh, for letting me um, uh, have a few minutes with you. Well, more than a few minutes. I am going to take more than a few minutes with you, so uh, stay tuned. Um, a lot of you may not uh, know, since you're from another area uh, and haven't, uh, taken a degree here, you may not know about our libraries, but particularly about our special collections department, and we don't really want it to be the biggest secret in town, but until you need to use some of our materials or, or until you hear about a lot of our materials, you may not know about uh, what we have. So what I'd like to do is connect you uh, as I do with many of the people that come in to use the Special Collections uh, Department with some more knowledge about our department. And you can think about some of the materials that you may have at home uh, because we'll be jumping off from the kind of things that we have here. And I can only give you a very small slice of that information. Um, and I'll be uh, able to a few treasures, just a few. It's like picking only one child to save, and it's hard. So let me begin by talking about the Special Collections Department that's located in the library within this new building known as the Mathewson IGT Knowledge Center. That's International Gaming Technology. It's very, very Nevada, um, which opened in 2008. And here's an interior shot of the inner atrium, which extends four floors. Uh, this is floor two, our main floor, which is just above us. Special Collections is located on the third floor at the top of this Gone with the Wind staircase. Um, But that's our area right there behind the next uh, stairwell. Uh, and if you go on the tour, we'll be uh, uh, going by this. And 
Uh, after uh, passing through our exhibit room, which is off that entrance, you enter the special collections reading room. Our materials do not circulate, uh, so they all must be used on site. We page out everything for our users, and a staff person is always available in the room to assist people with questions and requests for our materials. We are open to everyone. You don't have to just be related, affiliated, or whatever to anyone at UNR. You don't have to be a student. You don't have to teach here or anything. Public is welcome. How do we get our materials? We have a very small, see how small that is? Very small acquisitions budget to purchase materials from vendors or at auction. Buying items of interest at auction can be very difficult, however, due to the uh, oftentimes uh, bidding frenzy, which does happen, especially when it's something I really want. And it's hard to hear about Nevada materials, which may crop up in the many auction house websites. There are so many. This is also true for things that might be found on eBay. Many folks believe selling individual items from their family's collective past is more important than donating them. This is oftentimes a sign of the difficult financial times in which we are living, as well as the very mistaken belief that these materials may bring top dollar in the marketplace. <coughs> On the right are the uh, materials that are donated by people, businesses, and organizations who are concerned about how they can safeguard the legacy of their professional work, their lives, as well as their accomplishments. They hope that others can use some small portion of what they are offering to piece together some aspect of Nevada's history. Now, usually the materials we receive are not contemporary in nature, but more historical. We're usually a decade or more behind today's uh, calendar. For many families, it's not until the grandchildren or even the great-grandchildren lose interest in the family's history that we receive a donation since no one in the family is interested, I've heard that uh, so many times, in keeping that stuff. But unfortunately, we often don't hear about materials which might be donated until after a death or a move out of a house where those old materials are oftentimes tossed out. Family members we know are often faced with a daunting task and sometimes qu a quick deadline to clean out their parents' or their grandparents' houses, places where families have lived for decades. For us, it's not always easy to know who may have materials that we might be interested in unless somebody close to the person or concerned about the materials tips us off. We try to follow these leads whenever we can and we hope that you folks may be able to assist us in searching for appropriate items. What do we collect? Could be slightly different than what you have, but let me go over this. The Special Collections Department and the University Archives, which are uh, combined, contains items that cannot be shelved with the library's general collection because of their value, fragility, or format or because they are part of a specialized subject collection. For security, these materials are kept in a restricted stack area, and as I mentioned, may only be used in the department's reading room. So these include rare and valuable books, maps, architectural drawings, uh, multimedia items, manuscripts, photographs, university records, these last items are what I'll be uh, focusing a little bit more on today. The Special Collections Department develops and maintains a number of important subject collections. These specialized collections support research on the history of Nevada and the Great Basin region, including our general Nevada collection, our Great Basin Indian collection, Nevada Women's Archives, and Nevada Fiction, and other areas of research such as Women in the West collection, and the Book Arts collection. Now, all aspects of our collections work together for the research needs. We want to connect our users to the materials that they need to produce the articles and books which are published about our area. 
Our book collections cover the subject areas that I mentioned. The Book Arts Collection is concerned with the history of and printing of books and artistic creations of books. In order to show the history of printing to students, we have some representative samples, and these are really yummy. At top is a Sumerian tab clay tablet from about 3000 BC, which we had a scholar come through who could read cuneiform, and it turns out to be a receipt for a boat. Turns out the Sumerians like to keep a lot of detailed records, and there are a lot of these little clay tablets around. You'll probably uh, not find these, though, outside of a museum, so we're very lucky to have something like this. At left are some of the pages of unilluminated manuscripts. These are the handwritten ones. Uh, these are approximately from about the 14th century. And at right is an early example of a book printed with mo movable type. This is referred to as incunabula. This, uh, these are materials printed before 1501 that are done with movable type. There is a very large similarity between the look of the pages here with over here, as you can see, we have these large leading letters here. Oftentimes, these are gilt uh, with gold. Uh, this particular one has gold and extra embellishments around it. More work has been done on this uh, particular volume. Uh, it turns out that there is a, a nunnery of uh, that in Italy that did produce this particular volume. So it wasn't just the men doing this work and it wasn't just those guys in the monasteries doing all of this. Yay, ladies. At left is another uh, early in Canabula piece. This is referred to as the Nuremberg Chronicles. It's printed in Latin. It was done in Germany in 1493. It has uh, hand colored uh, woodblock prints uh, in it. And what it is is the history of the world as it was known up to that time. Uh, this is interesting because some of the wood blocks, there are many throughout this very large volume, but oftentimes when you're looking at it, you think, haven't I seen this one already, this, this illustration? Yeah, they ended up using some of these over again just because, you know, we had them, so we printed them. At the right is uh, the first page of Shakespeare's play, The Merchant of Venice, which is taken from the first folio of his collection of plays. So this is dated 1623. Now we have this rare item as well as copies of the same play from the second third and fourth Shakespeare folios due to a donation from a Gareth Hughes who gave up his life as an actor and thus gave up his worldly goods, joined the church, became a priest, and uh, ended up working with a Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe. Thank you, Brother David. We have a signed copy of an 1883 Life Among the Paiutes, Their Wrongs and Claims by Sarah Winnemucca Hopkins. Most of us just know her by those first two names, Sarah Winnemucca. She championed the desperate plight of her people through this book and through the publication of this book to the world beyond reservations. Her statue is one of the two Nevada statutes, stat, statues that reside in Washington, D.C., and you can see a copy of that down at the Capitol building in Carson City. John C. Fremont, the explorer, published his 1851 report of the exploring expedition he led with his guide, Kit Carson, through the Rocky Mountains, Oregon, and California from 1842 to 1846. He is the first American to see Lake Tahoe. He called it Lake Bigler. 
But here is the illustration from his report for Pyramid Lake. Here's a small selection of the book arts books from our collection. These are often closer to works of art created by artists who have deconstructed the book into these various formats. Usually these are handmade, quote, books and hand printed oftentimes on special papers, oftentimes handmade, and created in very, very limited editions. This collection supports curriculum for our book arts and art students. There are many more wonderful items that I can tell you about, but I have to move on to the best part, manuscripts. So what kind of materials are there in manuscript collections? So if you think about that closet, those files, or even the boxes in the basement or garage, don't keep them in the garage, that you may have in your home or all that good stuff you want to save is stashed. What do you have? Are there some treasured books, like perhaps a family Bible? How about those completed IRS tax forms, a lot of photos and photo albums, your children's drawings through the years, maybe letters of your parents, maybe your grandparents, and are there other things that you've placed in your bank's safety deposit box, legal documents such as the deeds, the wills, the trust documents, because of course you're working with your attorneys and they've told you put those in a very safe place, your stocks, your passports, along with maybe old coins, family jewelry, etc. Now these are types of materials that have meaning and historical value to a person, but there are only some of these types of things that you can find in a manuscript collection. For example, we accept very few artifacts as that type of material is normally saved by mu museums and not manuscript repositories. For the donated materials we accept, we have everyone sign our deed of gift form. With this form, the donor signs over all rights which they have uh, so that we can make our materials as widely available to users as possible. Now, we describe the materials in, a, in the space, usually an overview of what they are, especially if the collection is large. If the donor wishes to have any items returned, which we do not wish to keep, we have a space for you to include that. Um, if there are restrictions, there's an area to delineate that as well. And then the donor signs and dates the form, which is also signed by our staff, and the donor receives a copy of this for their records. For the materials which the donor wants to take a tax donation for, we cannot provide any value for them if we receive them. Just like the Salvation Army or other organizations accepting items, the donor has to set the value of the material for tax purposes, unless the items are worth over $5,000. In that case, you do need an outside appraiser, one who is acceptable to the IRS with qualifications acceptable, who will conduct the appraisal. It will be a written appraisal. They must make a copy of it available to us. And if you do do something like that, there is additional, an additional IRS form that also must be completed and signed through our campus foundation director. Now, how do we decide what we keep? So faced with an enormous amount of materials which come to you, an archivist like myself must appraise the items which may make up a collection. It's necessary to have that archival training at the master's degree level. Other degrees are helpful. Um, knowledge about American history and trends as well as an in-depth knowledge about collections already accepted within a repository are a must. In this way, you can evaluate if the offered materials have the necessary research value, not market value, which will meet the user's needs. And doing appraisals is, as I've said, one of the most challenging aspects of archival work. It can often feel like that Sophie's Choice situation who will live and who won't? And if I don't keep this piece of paper, will some history be lost? 
Well, not all personal papers will encompass the same types of items either. There are some archival rules that we follow, but they aren't chiseled in stone as they may shift as we review one type of collection from another. Something from a person will be different from a business or organization. So for example, saving financial ledgers from a Comstock load mine may be very important in order to understand the amount of ore milled and processed and what the profits were. Saving financial materials like canceled checks from an individual's personal collection may not always be that important. For saving correspondence, though, from businesses and individuals almost always is important, for it is in this type of material that you can often find the why behind a decision which was made, not just that there was a decision. And it's this type of information that is the backbone for good, reliable history writing. Now here are some examples of just a few items from our collections. Now we don't always have letters sent from Nevada as they oftentimes travel back to families or friends to other locations. So we're really lucky to have this one from the Jewett Family Papers. It captures the time in the single male viewpoint. Oh, I love this letter. Virginia City, November 21st, 1865. Dear brother, and he's writing to Captain Oscar Jewett from Alonzo Jewett. What in the world is the reason you don't write to me? I have not received a letter from you since June. I have written to you twice since then and received no answer. Once I wrote to Camp Douglas and once to Fort Laramie. I have had a great deal of trouble on your account. Report came to me that you was killed. And a few days after that, it was contradicted and said you was slightly wounded in the leg. Now the letter goes on with some of the other news. All of the Nevada volunteers of Fort Churchill were mustered out Friday last. Virginia is full of them. And they always refer to Virginia City as Virginia. Bill Frieden is here. His wife has got a bill of divorce from him. Matt Siemens, you know, is married to a spinster by the name of Thomas. She's got a daughter two weeks old. The indications are fair for her for being a good breeder. I like to bring out Anna Lander West McDonald's passport from her uh, manuscript collection to show students. And with her other uh, papers, we have an intriguing glimpse into Mrs. McDonald's life, especially that material immediately following World War I when she returned to France under the auspices of the American Committee for Devastated France. Her US passport, French identity cards, and travel permits which are part of this, as well as her correspondence to the American Committee for Devastated France on her behalf, document this involvement. On the left is her 1916 passport, a very large piece of paper with her photo at the top left. And on the right is the one closer to what we think about today as a passport, this one from 1955. You need to understand that we do wish to collect an entire life of a person, even if they do travel beyond Nevada. Now, rationing books from the Great Depression are something that today's students and many adults now have had no experience with, but many of people uh, have heard of. And so we can bring out this um, book and show the tokens, the ration tickets which are left, and some of the paperwork a person needed to have in order to get food, gas, and other daily needs. George Brunton was inducted into the Army in 1943. He wrote back to his family in McGill, Nevada, sounding just like so many soldiers with the complaints. In part, his letter, was, which is written from Boise on April 28, 1943, reads thus, Dear folks, we got through shoot, shooting yesterday, and I qualified as a marksman with a score of 
153 out of 200, I should have done much better, and it's my own fault that I didn't. I hope that letter about that diploma thing reaches you in time. I forgot about the damn thing. I don't think I'm going to be shipped, but if I do and it doesn't reach me in time, my next CO can sign it just as well. There really isn't anything to write about. We have been shooting until 8 or 9 o'clock Monday and Tuesday nights, and today we went back into our same old routine and it rained like hell. I got your package and that diary Saturday night. I sure like them. I will keep the diary up to date because I know I will want it in later years. Well, only two more days and I will know what's what, or at least I hope I will. Well, I must quit and shower. It's almost bedtime and they're going to come in and inspect the rifles. I will write soon. Love, George. I love the part where he wants to maintain the diary and he's thinking about the future experiences with an historical view. Now, George Brunton graduated from UNR in 1950. He went on to receive his PhD in mini mineralogy in 1957 from Indiana University and became a research geologist and professor of geology. Now, Robert Laxalt is one of Nevada's distinguished writers. And while working as a reporter, Laxalt began writing short stories and magazine articles, selling his first one by 1948. By 1952, he was working on his first novel, and eventually he published 16 books, both novels and nonfiction. All of his books are based on Nevada and his Basque heritage, or Basque, the Basque country. He became the first director of the University of Nevada Press, serving from 1961 until 1983. He deposited his papers here so that researchers can use them to understand more about his writing process. This is one of the letters in his collection. Dated 1955, Laxalt is working on his novel, Sweet Promised Land, and he's writing to his agent back in New York. He's working at the university at this point. He says, what with preparations for the fall semester and the actual opening of school, things have been busy and work on the book has slowed more than I liked. However, I have another five chapters to, ready to send you within the next two weeks. I think you will like them even more than the first offering. Please scrap the original title. I didn't realize how bad it was until after I'd sent it in. The new one will be Sweet Promised Land. It's taken from a little known ballad, the chorus of which goes, this is the land of the vine and the tree. This is the land that old Moses shall see. This is the land for my children and me, the Sweet Promised Land of Nevada. After reading that, I hope the new title doesn't, also doesn't become extremely tentative, but it's a very good ballad. And what with the chapters to come dealing much with love of land, being born out of cruelty of the deserts and suffering, it seems to fit. Bear with me, I'll get there finally. We have a number of items of interest in the university archives collections which show the aspects of the campus history. This is the Book of the Oaths and it's on display out in the lobby. Begun in 1920 and continuing until 1964, the university's high standards for scholarship training and for service to the person's generation by each graduate was set forth in this unique Book of the Oath. This handsome volume is bound in Nevada's silver and blue and contains 100 vellum sheets in anticipation that its solemn civic pledge will receive the, the accepting signatures of the classes for 100 years. A vellum page is reserved for the signatures of each graduating class. The oath ends with, quote, I shall serve both alone and with others to the high ends that uncleanness, greed, selfishness, and pride shall lessen, that cleanness, charity, 
comradeship and reverence shall widen, and this, my generation, shall bequeath an even better and nobler civilization than came to it." End quote. Now, this oath was administered at the commencement exercises to each graduating class by either the Chief Justice or an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of Nevada, and each graduate signed on his page. Now, you might be asking me, so I'm anticipating this question, if this was supposed to go for 100 years, why did it only go from 1920 to 1964? Each class became larger. Each class took more pages to have everybody sign. We were nearing the end of the volume in 1964, and I don't have the good reason for sure why it ended, but it was also the 60s. And people oftentimes did not want to deal with doing things that the establishment had set up. That's my guess. But we were running out of pages. Now, how do we process the materials for our users? Now, materials come to us in all types of boxes or are loose. They're mailed or stuffed into people's cars, which arrive at our curb. And we sometimes are able to pick up larger donations, but our shrinking staff numbers in special collections can make that difficult these days uh, during the last uh, two sets of legislative uh, uh, years. We've, ha we've lost three positions in our department. Here's what you do. You need to get an intellectual grasp over the physical material. So you survey what you have received and you see the kinds of materials that make up the collection. You find out about the person, the family, the organization, or the, biz or the business, and you use any sources that you can for this material. But you usually want to start with the person or the donor, as usually they can best explain what they are giving you. But oftentimes we have to look into the collection and find what we can for this information. And you can see the type of boxes that these materials come in. You want to create the best environment for the materials that you can, and this is one of the main tenets. So you place the items into acid-free materials, acid-free folders, acid-free boxes. Now some collections are small, sometimes only one or maybe only a few items, while others are many, many, many linear feet. These materials need to be arranged so that you, the user, can understand what you're looking at, not that mishmash that you saw that are just things dumped into those first boxes. And if the collection is large enough or complex, we place them into what we've referred to as series, which makes sense for the users. Correspondence usually goes with other correspondence. Uh, financial records are grouped together and so on. And then we place these items into the series order and we number each of the folders. We also make a guide if the collection is large and complex enough. We create a summary statement for the person or organization and one for the contents. On the right uh, is a part of the guide where we indicate information about the materials in the series. And on the left, we start to write more detailed scope and content notes. And we continue this all the way through drilling down. And we get an overview summary for each of those series, for each level that we have. And each of the series, again, has more detailed information about what's in it, how large it is, and any other important information for the user. Then each numbered folder I, and its heading is indicated on the guide. And for every manuscript and archived collection, there is an online catalog record. This goes along with all the other materials that we have in our library, no matter where they are. This is not true, however, for our photographs and architectural drawings, which have their own database. How do you handle the different types of materials that people give you? 
Well, we try to save things for posterity, but as you know, forever is hard to maintain when materials were not made to last that long. We do remove all the photographs from a manuscript collection and place them together. They need different handling materials, uh, different handling for these materials, and we sleeve them to protect them from mishandling and abrasions. We box most materials which can be boxed. A large ledgers, scrapbooks, they go into the flat boxes as you see here. On that's a Comstock load ledger. Don't you love the way those look? Oh, I love that. And then these are the photo albums. Uh, sometimes we have to create our own boxes for materials which are in poor shape. And we also encapsulate, not laminate, uh, maps and architectural drawings between two pieces of inert polyester, which oftentimes goes by the name of mylar. We do have a small fume hood to uh, de-acidify the materials which are too acidic and are deteriorating. But preservation of the materials is difficult for many mediums. We save back, quote, the archival copy as close to that origin as we can and have researchers use copies of the originals for films. We create a user copy, which that is a goal that cannot always be met as we need to use outside vendors to make quality reproductions, especially now when people want the digital formats, and this can be very costly. Audio as well has changed from what you see here on the left. These are wire recordings. Anybody know about the wire recordings? Late 40s uh, and into early 50s. It's on a spool. It's just like thread almost. It tends to break, it tends to bend. It wasn't really that uh, good. And luckily went on to the more established reel-to-reel, -reel, which then changed into cassette tapes. And of course, everyone wants to now have their digital copies. Uh, we have to oftentimes use outside vendors to transfer this work. Uh, what you see here are some samples from some of our Great Basin Indian collections. So is everything digitized? No. We may not live long enough, have as ample a budget needed or enough helping hands to do so. We did, though, start digitizing uh, our work on our 200,000 plus images and our photograph collections due to reproduction as well as research needs, and we're chipping away at those. We currently have about, or maybe over 5,000 images in our digital collections, and all of these can be viewed online. And these are just some of the ones that you'll see where we have them. But it's not the digitizing that takes the time, it's the information that you need that goes with it, the identification, uh, for such things as the dates, the locations, a description of the photograph. And once we have this work done, we mount the image on our website of those digital photographs that I showed you before. Now, what you see here, that handsome devil grinning at the camera, everybody recognize? Clark Gable. He loved to do this hunting and fishing thing, so he would go in many places. And here he's, we can find him fishing at the Pyramid Lake Club. And underneath uh, this area, you'll see just the beginning of some of the information that goes along so that you're not just looking at this and saying, well, what time period is this? Where are we? That's the information that researchers want and that we have to try to provide. And please identify your photographs. We get an awful lot of Nevada with Great Basin sage, and it's really hard to know where we are. All that sagebrush starts looking the same year after year after year. How do we put our materials away? 
In planning for this, our new building, the circulation area was going to use a new system for storing their older titles and journal runs, and our department was going to be doing that too, using a robotic automated storage and retrieval system, or ASRS, and our system is named MARS, which stands for Mathewson Automated Retrieval System. Now, Mars is made up of a series of four feet by two feet uh, steel bins of various heights that are stacked on top of each other in racks four floors high. And a motorized unit passes up and down an aisle and picks out the correct bin from either the left or the right side for the needed item and brings it to a workstation. Special Collection uses uh, aisles, uh, two of the six aisles that are available. And the entire system is controlled through the use of barcodes, which are entered into a software system which controls not only what is displayed to the public in the online catalog, but also behind the scenes to staff um, managing the information. This system talks to the Mars software through that barcode. Our bins are two feet by four feet long and pretty much all of them are 12 inches high, just over the height of a record uh, carton. We can fit four cubic feet of box material in the bin. Our materials are restricted from being called out by the circulation staff on the lower floor and their materials from us. Each box is also replaced in the same bin, unlike the books in the circulation sy system, which rely only on the height of the book and can be replaced in any bin of the correct height. Flat boxes with scrapbooks and those ledgers are kept in our closed stacks area and are not placed in Mars. Closed stacks also holds all of our book collection, our photograph collections, architectural drawings, maps, and other oversized materials. Now there is the question of electronic records because while we are still receiving mainly paper-based materials, uh, it's changing, it's starting to change now. Again, we're a little bit behind that curve of what we receive from contemporary materials. The important changes are now upon us and with these items, uh, we refer to these as born digital, created only on a computer or a digital camera or other digital recording device. So what is going to be available in the future? Being created on a computer means that they can easily be deleted from files or from websites quickly. And you probably have had this, if you've ever tried to follow an old URL of what looks like great information, you click on that link only to get that annoying error message. And how do you capture a website of an organization which constantly changes that information uh, that it makes available to the public? Now these are very big concerns to we archivists who do this work and it's not one that's easily solved. We've all lost important information since we began using the telephone and we stopped writing letters. We do write emails now but who in this audience uh, keeps their emails and doesn't end, uh, end up using that delete key. And what I'm concerned about is the loss of what this important information is going to be for tomorrow's uh, future historians or others trying to utilize this information. If you don't have trusted sources, you can look at and you can evaluate in whatever format they're in, digital or otherwise, how do you know what is true and reliable? And now we're going to turn to the part that I know you're wanting to ask more questions. How we can help our broken books. Oh, right. If you have books where the front cover is beginning to tear away from the book block, and this is a very common occurrence. It probably looks like the one on the right, or maybe it's all the way off. Please don't try to tape the book back together with reams of duct tape, or even scotch tape, as you see here. 
and stay away from pouring glue down the spine and slapping that together to try to hold everything. Here is a low cost and satisfactory solution that I recommend. What you need to use is a cotton tape and tie the book together. Sometimes you may need to tie it uh, as well on all sides, but at least this way. It holds it nice and tight together and always place the bow away from the spine in the end where the book block is and there's usually a little indent. You don't ever want to put it on the side, either side, because you're going to be pressing that bow into what even could be a leather binding and you don't want to make another indentation. You can place this on the spine, but I recommend on this end because if you still want to set your book up, uh, you want to be able to read that information and oftentimes the bow gets in the way. It's really easy and really works. For the more loved books where there are loose pages and covers coming off, and again, this is one of our very early ones, we may oftentimes need to create a custom box so that the book is well supported, very tight in that, and um, uh, it doesn't move around inside the box. These are made of heavier acid-free board, and the four flaps are oftentimes held together with Velcro, uh, Velcro strips. This needs more advanced skills, obviously, but you can also wrap books in a similar design with acid-free paper and then tie them using that cotton tape that I mentioned. Okay, let's talk about photographs. Photos are treasured items which may have been in, with a family for decades, maybe even for a century, and it's important to know what kinds of photo processes that you have. It's very important to hold all photo prints and negatives just at the edges. Don't put your finger, as I see all the time, right in the middle of the print. It's ultimately best to handle all photos with cotton lintless gloves as the oils and surface dirts, even off of your newly washed fingers, will transfer to the image. So sleeve your photos, that's the best way. If you've ever seen an older folder where, a photo where somebody has handled it, CSI Reno, Nevada could come in and see that and figure out from a fingerprint who the guilty party is. <laughs> Since photographs were first begun in the 1840s, there have been a change in processes nearly every decade during the 1800s. So let's look at a few things that you might have if you have a lot of your family's history. You may have a daguerreotype. This was the first practical form of photography. It's usually issued in a case, and it was mainly done through the 1840s and 1850s. Daguerreotypes came in a variety of sizes, and daguerreotypes have no negatives. Your print is your negative. The image is printed on a piece of glass, and this glass should be stored in the original case as these images are fragile. And you can oftentimes uh, date them, not exactly, but you can date them more closely by the size and shape of the gold looking uh, holder that surrounds this. The simpler ones are usually earlier, the more ornate ones are oftentimes a little later. Now, ambrotypes also came in cases, and they as well should be kept in holders. This process was popular a little bit later, from the 1850s and into the 1860s, and don't these look a lot like daguerreotypes? But ambrotypes can be identified by the positive and negative image on the glass plate of the image, which in this picture is brought up by placing a black background under the plate. And when you are looking at these, if they're in the case, you oftentimes have to look at the image on a slight angle to see it. And again, each image is unique. There was no negative. Tintypes can oftentimes be found in cases. 
but often were given out with these paper covers that you see in the center and on the right. But oftentimes these wear off and are usually missing. There are also no negative with tintypes. The image is, is it. It's printed on a thin sheet of iron and the back is usually covered with a layer of black paint. The process from you was used from the 1850s and into actually the early 20th century. Now these images can be scratched or the metals can be bent and these always, because they're metal, need to be kept away from moisture. Now albumin prints are probably the most common type of print made during the 19th century. These may look more familiar to you. The process used a colloid which came from egg whites and these are examples of the carte de visite prints named for the same size that the calling cards were. They could be hand tinted as you see, um, not real well in this picture. Uh, this one you can see a faintly some pink around the edges. Uh, or they're even um, printed, uh, excuse me, are there oftentimes on the bottom or on the back printed with the photographer and or studio names. So this can oftentimes help with locations and dates. Now albumins are very sensitive to light, keep them out of direct sunlight, and they will almost always fade to kind of a yellowish color. It will look kind of like slightly cooked eggs. Now nearing the beginning of the 20th century, negatives were made using papers or plastics coated with a gelatin emulsion, creating a flexible roll film, and thus the brownie camera came to be. During different types of, gelat different types of gelatins were oftentimes used, but many were discarded, uh, such as the one that created the highly flammable nitrate film that you have probably heard of. The backings, using acetate for the plastic and referred to as safety film, which uh, comes from 1937 and actually goes into about 1956 and is marked safety film, uh, is not. It had problems with the emulsions shrinking at a different rate than the backings. So you will oftentimes see that these items will separate uh, if you see this, you need to immediately separate these types of negatives from the rest of your photos. In 1947, Kodak did introduce another type of safety film, which used cellulose triacetate, which didn't have these uh, problems, and it was widely used uh, into the 1960s, and then polyester was used as the base. In 1935, uh, American Kodak introduced the first modern color foam, Kodachrome, based on three color emulsions. It was developed as a direct positive transparency or oftentimes as a slide. These colors can shift to the pinks or yellow tones, as you can see with the ectochrome, which is uh, on the upper left and lower right. This shifting of color cannot be stopped. Other photo problems which are out of your hands can begin with the photographer not washing off enough of the chemicals during the development process and thus the image fades. Uh, this is oftentimes due to, uh, excuse me, uh, this is the one right here that's fading. I like to call this the little devil baby because this albumin was not washed well or was in direct sun and all you can see is the hand tinted eyes that are left. So I, I like the little devil baby a lot. Um, uh, now on this other side you can see this what's oxidation, it, it's called a silvering. Here's the print, here's the silvering look that you oftentimes get. Again this is, this is from oxidation from mostly pollutants. Um, you want to probably copy or scan these images before the deterioration continues. Also make sure that your older framed photographs are not still backed with wood, 
which has lignans in it, which can bleed through the photo, as you see right here. Here's the circle that it was in, and you see part of the wood backing coming through. Also, frame photos should have the map positioned along the edge of the photo, unlike the one that's seen here that's slightly lower. Uh, and, you, and you can barely see some of the hand-colored uh, area up here. But the rest of this and down the side has been exposed. This whole area has been exposed. And here we see the fading of this it, particular images. Do not mark your photos even on the back with ink. Here you can see the postmark stamp on these that are bleeding through, right in here. That one's harder to see. Resist the temptation to label your photos on the front of the image. Always use a number two pencil and write lightly along the edge on the back, or better yet, give the photo a number and write the information that you need on another sheet of paper. Everybody, you may not be able to see this too well, everybody has their name, which we appreciate having the members of the band there, uh, but uh, don't do this. Photo albums can have identification on the album page if you have these type of albums, so you want to keep that information together if you decide to remove the photos. Uh, and this is the kind of thing oftentimes from the 20s, the 30s with these photo albums that you see. So here's what you can do. Photocopy the entire page, if you can using acid-free paper, to capture that image of the entire page. As someone took the time to place these photos in a particular order, this made sense to them you want to try to maintain that. Give each image a number on the back if you're removing it, or along the edge on the front if you're not. Uh, write the photo number and the caption information on another sheet of paper. If you have photos still in the magnetic photo albums, and I have these too, get them out as soon as possible as the glues and the plastics will destroy your photos. You have these, you know what I'm talking about? They were inexpensive, these were the only things available to us, we all slapped our photos in there. They're killing your photos. Now if your um, scrapbook has both photos and clippings in it, the acids in the newspapers, again those lignans that we were talking about, that might have been backed on your frames, can also damage your photos because acids will continue to travel in both directions through any pages. If you've seen this in a book where somebody has put a newspaper clipping, you'll see it go both directions there. Place a sheet of acid-free but unbuffered paper between the pages if you have photographs on this other side. Photographs uh, need unbuffered paper. Regular other materials have to have buffered paper. It's a chemical thing, believe me. Now resist the urge to scotch tape or glue your materials onto your scrapbook pages, although uh, scotch tape used to be the miracle thing and everybody heard that it, you could take it off easily. We now know another lie, another lie. These will both make permanent changes on your treasured materials as well as on the scrapbook pages. And what oftentimes will happen, as you see here, these are the glues coming through. They're still holding down, that's good, but oftentimes if we have uh, things with uh, just scotch tape, the, the, this will leave a mark but the paper backing of the scotch tape will fly off if you've opened these up. So watch out, things start flying out of your album pages. So best practices. 
Keep your items out of direct sunlight or anything that you would consider to have UV light. And I don't know for sure about these new bulbs that we're all getting because they have UV in them. The old incandescent bulbs had heat but weren't a problem if they didn't have any UV. The new ones may, so watch these. I haven't seen any uh, information on these yet. But remember, light continues to accumulate. So think of your skin. If you've been out and you never took care of your skin, you know the ravages of what it does. It's the same with any of these materials. Keep your materials at a relative temperature, hopefully around 68 degrees. What you don't want to do are these high swings and lows in temperature that really are very hard for the, the materials. Your materials have moisture in them. They're what we call hydrographic. And the moisture will contract and expand with those highs and lows. And if you do it too much, particularly with your photos that are layers of chemicals, you will start seeing deterioration. Keep everything at a relative humidity at about 30 to 50 percent. I put this up here as a goal to reach because we live in Nevada. <laughs> Always have a good flow of air to the materials. Watch out as well. Check your materials. Watch out for insects. If you find things like silverfish, uh, hopefully, uh, and they're in the dark, and if you see a large one that skitter scattles in your materials, know that where Grandpa lives, a lot of little guys are living too. But don't spray into your materials and never directly onto photos or any of your materials. Try to take those materials out. Make sure you take out, you check all your materials as much as possible. Sweep these items clean if you have them. Place them in a new box. Get rid of the other one. There could be more eggs that are ready to hatch. Make copies on acid-free materials of those valued items that you want the relatives or other folks to look at. And put those sacred objects of the originals away. Don't let them handle them, because they will mishandle them. You know those thumbs I was talking about. And always use a number two pencil, never a pen, to identify your materials. Place your materials as much as you can into acid-free containers and folders to create the best environment that you can. Sleeve your photos and sleeve other fragile papers. If you have things that are ripped or torn, put them in something that will help support them. Give your books good support. Don't let them slant on your shelves. Give them, make them upright. Make sure the books are tightly together, and that's one of the reasons you put that knot on the inside or the outside of the spine. Unfold and flatten the papers whenever possible. L paper has a memory, and it always wants to go back to the state it was. If it was rolled, it wants to stay rolled. If you have a large panoramic print, uh, if you've seen these large photographs, uh, maybe like your high school picture where there was some guy that stood on one end, the class clowned and ran around while the camera was moving, and then you see him at the other end of the photo. Don't try to flatten those out. You will crack the emulsion. The tighter it is, the more you can damage that. You can't bring that back. If you've already done this, don't do it again. You need to be able to introduce enough humidity and I don't uh, recommend this for those of you who don't know about this, but you, in order to make things want to go flat, again, we're in Nevada, you gotta give it some moisture back, you gotta give it a grasp or a gasp uh, of uh, that moisture and flatten it as best we can. Make sure if there's newsprint, it is ac very acidic there is nothing sacred about a newspaper. You want to save the content. You may really not need to keep 
the entire newspaper. If someone, and I see this in so many collections, there was something important in that newspaper. Maybe it's folded, maybe it's circled, okay. If you're going to do something with it, photocopy it, make sure you get the newspaper name, make sure you get the date that this is. These are important bits of your history that you want to know about. And then get rid of the newspaper if there is no more emotional value that you have to it. If you do, separate it from other materials. And always know how to handle your materials properly and tell others how to do the same. Now, if all of this seems way too daunting or if the family does not have enough interest in the materials, then consider donating to a special collections or historical society where the materials can be used by a wide array of people. Now, we need your help. We cannot collect Nevada's history by ourselves. We cannot tell the history of Nevada's residents without your help as you are out there working and knowing people, knowing something about somebody's life and about their knowledge. We hope that you will encourage other family members and people that you know to think about saving these legacies by donating them. There's only so many ways when you go down a family tree that you can continue to split these materials all the way through the children, the great grandchildren, and so on. Now, you should not wait to do this until the death. This process should and can be pursued during someone's lifetime to help us, to help anyone create an understanding about these past events. But saving history has a price, as we have just seen uh, with the technological changes that have been made in not only photographs and films, but things changing to DVDs and to other digital formats, the audio from the wire recordings to beyond cassettes. We cannot always afford here to reformat these materials to meet researchers' needs. Letters written on poor quality paper do not last well either. Backlogs of materials need to be addressed, and our budget and our staff are doing what we can to keep up, but we now have very strict uh, limitations. And we hope that future donations will arrive with the financial support needed to process them quickly and in the manner that they should be whenever that is possible. Nevada's history, as well as California's history, has more stories that need to be told. And financial support will, will ensure that this happens. We need your help to change this. I thank you very much. And I want to tell you outside, I do have, I'm going to ask for some questions now, but I also have outside for you a handout that will give you some information about our websites and as well information below how to find a conservator, uh, how to find an appraiser if you need other than this type of material but artwork, uh, houses, whatever. There is an American Association of Appraisers that is available and also uh, to donate your personal um, materials or an organization's materials to a repository. Uh, there is a brochure online that is available from the Society of American Archivists and I have a link to that. As well, when you go out, since I've given you all this basic information and you just got that right there, so I can really talk right about that real fast, I also have for you a guide that has been put together for how to care to your uh, to your care for your um, materials. A lot of this information is in here. This is written uh, somewhat for the layman, more for those of us who deal with the archival needs. But if you just want to read through it, I want you to be a better uh, consumer of good information. So if you go out and you want to buy a photo album, you have the knowledge about what it is you're looking for.
some things can be trusted more. They say acid-free. This didn't used to be available as much to others uh, 20 years ago, 15 years ago. We now have had, through a lot of genealogical assistance, a lot more of these materials available. I also have, um, uh, I, I can somewhat recommend uh, the Gaylord Company for their archival materials that they have, and they highlight some of this material here, uh, but they also have a catalog that you can look at or get. I have one other catalog in case you are wanting to take a look. I only have one catalog out there. Uh, we have pens. You can write down the link uh, for that. Hollinger Metal Edge, very trusted. They're on the West Coast. Uh, we we uh, buy in bulk, so I can't always tell you where to go to get this material locally. But uh, they're very good people, and they will answer a lot of questions. So thank you, and I will entertain some questions if you have some general ones now. If not, I will be able to uh, remain out there for those who want to go on the tours. Uh, we'll be meeting out there. Uh, we have some things if you didn't have time to take a look at that highlight what we have in special collections. But right now, questions. Do I have any? Yes, ma'am. Yes. 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 Yeah. It's pretty intense. If you've ever looked at it, it's like, you know, can't see. Uh, the more light that you have uh, on an image, on a piece of paper, as I said, this always accumulates. So photocopy once. There's a, there's a light with a scanner. Scan once. Make sure you have your best copy. Put those originals away. And if you don't have, at home, a photocopy machine. <laughs> so uh, if you want to go to something like a Kinko's, you might be able to take uh, some acid-free paper. You might call ahead to find out. Sometimes they do have this available, maybe a little bit more. But uh, you'll be able to get acid-free papers now from, say, Kinko's uh, or Office Depot or something. Get a ream. You can use it you, and ask them if you can put it into the photocopy machine to do your work. Oftentimes, they'll work with you, but you've got to ask. Don't just come in and start doing stuff. But yes, we'll always watch light. Watch with your frame materials being next to something where a window is. All of that is true for paintings as well. Another question right now. Yes. Yeah, the old unidentified well, photo trick. Should we keep them? Okay, should we keep unidentified photos? I think we've had this in our families as well. Uh, this woman works at the Northeast, um, give me the full title, Northeast, Northeastern, Northeastern Nevada Museum. And um, so she's yeah. got the same problem that we have coming in. Here's the photos, people. Good luck, you know, good luck. Um, Yes, you probably should. Uh, you should probably keep. Um, oftentimes, there can be some hints in letters or some other person that might come in. There are these little you know, links that we can sometimes get even from a greeting card that's you know, best friends that have come. Maybe they're in the photos. Um, and sometimes we do, we do uh, you know, they're not always as useful. But oftentimes, people come in. They know an area. They've got another relative. They can come in. They're looking at a particular area. Oh, yeah, uh, here's some stuff on Tonopah. Oh, I've got some stuff on Tonopah. And they can come in and help you do it. You know, it takes a village. Uh, um, and make sure what's archival about a photo, the photograph print or the photograph negative? OK, I'm giving you a hint. It's the negative. If you have your negatives, save those. Make sure you know what goes with the prints at all possible. 
Uh, you can scan from negatives on your scanner. You can flip those. If you don't have negatives, you do it from your prints. But uh, the print is what we call a second generation. You always want to save back to as close as the first generation as you have. And those are the negatives. And remember, you can sleeve those. Not your fingers. Yes. The po it's usually a, a polyester, mylar, polypropylene. They are out there. I I'm pretty sure Gordon's cameras, I heard, does have some of these sleeves. They have. Um, but not very pro probably the paper is not as good. You don't have something between you and the continual dust that comes in from Nevada, and those are going to abrade the emulsions. So if you can, uh, take those out and sleeve them out. They'll just do better. And then you can also, you know, arrange them, have your prints together, you know, so you, you know what you have a negative of. It, it takes a while to do this, but, you know, there are a lot of long nights in Nevada sometimes. So, yes, sir. Does Nevada sell these prints? Yes. Uh, no, not a specific one. No, we do, we do have a, a lot, well, we had a lot more before the last set of cuts went through uh, that devastated a lot of the colleges and departments. Uh, so not uh, per se, as in some, you know, some of the larger universities might, where they have major focuses. I have a lot of documents, yes. documents yes. that back to the Uh-huh. And where's the local area? Yeah, but you said you have things going back to a local area. Where's an example of one of your local areas? New York. New York, okay. okay. Uh, but the documents I have are relevant to Reno, Los Angeles, Seattle, Denver, New York, everywhere. Yeah, uh, I can probably help you with some information. Uh, uh, Michigan, I think, comes to mind. Uh, I I think they have one of the larger and uh, early. There and there may be more as well. There. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Um, make sure I get your information. I didn't. I forgot to bring down my cards, but I. I have uh, my uh, contact information on that sheet. Uh, let me know about that and we'll work together and help you find a, a place. Because you go labor, but you're also doing something with transportation aeronautics. And so we'll want to find a good fit there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's great because, like, what are you going to do with them, right? Yeah, right. Gentleman over here, yes. Yeah, well, your slides uh, are probably going to be Kodachrome or Ektachrome, I'm thinking, maybe Fuji. Um, your slides will probably be whatever they are. Kodachrome is the most stable. Ektachrome isn't. You'll s uh, my whole childhood, I think, was, you know, it's in pinks and yellows now. I don't, I never look good in pink, but I don't look good in yellow. Um, so there are... Uh, it's actually not too bad to keep them in slide holders. If you still have them in those, the plastics aren't too bad. But if you want to take them out and put them into some other sleeves, those are available that will be made out of the polyester. Uh, the films are a little bit more problematic because you'll have to go to a service um, if you want to get another copy of it. At this point, you would probably not be doing VHS. And again, there's always this generational thing, and it changes like this, just like I have to buy another computer. You know, does this make you angry? It makes me angry, too. So uh, the digital thing, you'll want to probably have a used copy of DVD. Um, if it's in a metal canister, I understand. I don't deal as much with footage. This is kind of a more specialized thing. But there are uh, inert plastics that you can get instead of the metal 
The metal can sometimes, you know, if it's a colder day when you open it, boom, what are you doing? You're creating a microclimate of that when you're closing it down because the air can't get in there. So think about that. You'll want to probably have something that uh, is, uh, you know, uh, a little bit more on the neutral side, and they, and they do have uh, materials available. And remember, you know, I know not everybody has a lot of money to spend on this, but if you care about your history and you want to pass it on, uh, the, that's one of the things you might want to take that extra step and, and see. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. And you're able on a scanner, uh, if you scan things that have gotten faint, you can do some things with that contrast and bring it up. It's amazing to see what was really in this photo, especially if you don't have the negatives for that. And that's, that's a good point. Uh, black and white is much more stable uh, than color has ever been. Uh, that's just been true. So your black and whites are going to be a lot, lot better. Your black and white negatives will be a lot more stable than your color ones will. It just, we live in a color world. Everybody got tired of looking at things and saying, gee, I wonder what color her dress was and were the trees green? So uh, those of us who grew up with it know the trees are green and her dress was a lovely color, whatever it was. Yes, any other questions right now? Well, you've been a great group. I'll be out in case you, another question uh, uh, comes to you. Thank you so much for your time on this. <laughs>